What's going on YouTube? Sharky here, and I'm back again with another video about the LD Moss mobile power supply. It's about done. I think I think I'm 99.9% .9 done with it. Uh, pretty much the only thing I want to do to it is make some covers for these holes on the front. Maybe plug a couple of the extra holes in the back and uh, that'll be it. But for now, I want to run it in the mobile and test it and make sure everything's going okay and uh, and all that good stuff. I've tested it here on the bench with the uh, janky bench power supply um, and I'm getting some really really decent results which is good because I put a lot of effort and a lot of time and I made a lot of modifications to those stupid cheap Chinese modules to get them working inside of here. So right now I've got the power supply running in what you, what you might call like an on-demand mode. So there's 14.4 volts going into it but uh, the power supplies are basically off. There's nothing coming out of the voltage except for 14.4 volts. So the way that these modules work is when they're turned off, they basically have a path straight through from the incoming power supply. So right now, the amplifier up here is getting that 14.4 volts. And you can see that because the LEDs are turned on. So this red LED here, this one uh, means that there's power coming into the unit. But it's only 14.4 volts. Um, which is cool because that's enough to I don't know why that's turning on but I'm sorry it's freaking loud um, the 14.4 uh, volts is actually it, it couldn't have worked out more perfectly it really couldn't have for reasons I'm not gonna go too too deep into detail but the fact that this has 14 volts going into it at all times is really really convenient for me so on the back here We've got this, uh, this is like a keying jack. So it's just one of those little guys. Connect that back in there. Um, so this is a keying jack. It's just a tip and sleeve plug. And when you connect the two together, it turns the module on. Um, that is also connected to my amplifier. So when you close those contacts, it activates the relay in here, turns the amp on, all that good stuff. So basically these are activating at the same time and there's a signal going to these two coming from my radio. Um, if you haven't seen it, I make a keying circuit that delays your radio 50 milliseconds before the amp turns on. Um, and that's what I got in there right now. With all the other circuitry inside of the radio, it actually ends up being like 120, 100 milliseconds, 125 milliseconds. So um, when you key down on this radio, um, it activates your amplifier, and in this case the power supply, about 100 milliseconds before it actually starts transmitting RF. So if you saw BVI's recent video, which was freaking cool to see it visualized, uh, if you if you hot key, you know your your contacts just sit there and spark. So uh, that's why I originally had it hooked up that way, but it, it worked out for another reason here. And uh, that little bit of time delay gives the power supply the, the short amount of time it needs to boost up the voltage before the amplifier starts drawing power. And I'm going to show you that on the oscilloscope because it's kind of cool. All right, so I'm going to put this into single trigger mode. So I've got uh, an RF sampler from the output of the amp going into channel one, which is the yellow. And I've got this oscilloscope in channel three, which is the uh, um, purple channel. And that is this probe here. So that's just monitoring the output voltage on this power supply. Not the input, but the output. So if we look at it right now, there we go. Okay, so this is our, uh, this is our output voltage, which is at 14.4. Um, that's the power that's going in, and like I said, it basically goes in one side and out the other. So that's, that's going to be normal. Uh, the yellow one's our RF sampler. There's nothing coming out of it, so you know, it's just a straight line. I'm going to put this into single, and we're going to take a sample of what this looks like when we first key it up. All right. So... This purple line is our voltage going from the 14.4 that it's resting at up to the 60, 65, 70 volt range. So this turns on rather quickly. Um, about 40 milliseconds after I after this button engages, um, this voltage is already up here at its peak. So if you look even closer, about 150 milliseconds after the voltage reaches its peak, the radio actually starts putting RF into that amp. And that's what's going on right here. So this little dip, I think that's just a, uh, 
uh, load issue. Um, could be because it's all happening really quickly and it, it has to take a moment to respond to it. That would make sense because the power supply has to compensate for that transient and it's a pretty large transient. So I think that's what that dip is right there. It's just a little transient dip before the power supplies have, a, have a, enough time to compensate the voltage up. Um, but as you can see, our power supply is turning on quite a bit sooner than the RF is, which is perfect. So the power supplies aren't booting up under load. Um, it gives the mo a moment for the voltage to actually get up to where it needs to be before we start putting RF in. So honestly, it couldn't have worked out much better than that. I don't think I could have planned it better. Who am I kidding? I planned all that exactly to happen. But there was some luck involved. Getting that took a little bit of luck, not going to lie. So uh, that was just a, a small dead key that I was running out of it. Um, let's uh, let's put a little more power out of it. Okay, so this is a thousand watt slug coming out of my amplifier. And we're at 2x, I think. There we go. Alright. So that's a thousand watts average, just a carrier coming out of here. We're drawing about 120 amps on the 14.4 volt power supply. Um, it's probably drawing about 25 amps at 50 volts going in, somewhere in that ballpark. Let's push it a little harder. Okay. So that was about a 1500 watt carrier, and it handled it. Um, the problem is, is this power supply is pretty janky, and I can't go much higher than that, otherwise this thing just clicks off and trips out. And it, it works for small stuff, but you know when you start getting over 100, 150 amps, this thing gets a little cranky, and uh, you know that's what you get when you mess with the cheap Chinese modules and expect them to uh, be perfect because they ain't. There's also a bad module in there, so anything over 150 is guaranteed to fail. But anywho, um, it's working. It's doing what I want it to. I think it's going to be wonderful. Let me pop open this lid, and I'll show you what's inside. Would you look at that mess of wires and inductors and capacitors and circuit boards. There's a whole lot going on in here, man. So if you watched my previous videos on these, um, you might have, have some inclination on, on what's happening inside here with these modules. So long story short, these modules really, really suck for this application. They really suck. I'm pretty sure that there's better modules out there. Um, in fact, I've been told that there's significantly better modules out there that do the job way better. Um, but I, I don't have one of those right now. Otherwise, I'd show you, and we'd test it, and we'd see why that module's better. But I don't. So for now, you're going to have to take my word for it. These are not the best modules for this job. And had I known that back when I was ordering all this stuff, I would have gone a different route. But I ordered them. Um, and I made the best of it, you know, I, I, I powered through, I powered through cause you know, it's not like I'm going to sell this thing or anything. It's just for me. This is for my project. This is for my stuff. I don't want to spend a bunch of money going around in circles and trying all different modules and waste a bunch of money and have a whole stack of modules that I'm not going to use. So I made do and I modified these things to death. Well, not that much, but enough to like, I had to take circuits off the board, man. <laughs> so this, for example, each one of these modules had a little tiny, uh, uh, it's a buck module, a little tiny integrated circuit right there, a little eight pin IC. I had to pry each one of those off of every one of these boards. And I had to supply power to the control circuitry, um, externally. So let me give you a walkthrough of, of really what's going on here. So on this side, we've got our 12 volt input. I use two of these studs because at full power, this thing is going to draw, you know, 400 amps or so, 450. Um, so the uh, the two positives are together. The grounds are just connected to chassis. And on the other side, we got the output, just a pair of studs. This is our 65 volt output, and I've got a capacitor on the input and the output. Um, this one's a lower rating. This one's a higher rating for the voltage. And that's just to hopefully smooth out some of the um, smooth out some of the inrush current when you first turn these on. Hopefully these capacitors will help smooth that out. 
Um, I can tell you for sure that these things have a lot of inrush current and it, it really pisses off my power supply if I try to fire these things up under load. Um, if I was using like a 12 volt battery or something, I'm sure it'd be fine. But uh, the inrush current is enough to piss off the cheap Chinese modules in there to where it just triggers over and over again and behaves badly. Um, so each one of these modules has 12 volts going into it and the outputs are paralleled but before they paralleled there's a diode and a resistor underneath so I'll splice that in so you can see it. But um, there's a diode here it's about a 10 amp diode going to a, a sandbar resistor, a 10 watt 0.22 ohm sandbar resistor. And that's down inside of there. You can kind of see it in there. Um, and what those do is they balance the current. So if you match the voltages on these really closely, the resistor will limit the current going through each one of them and it will kind of balance among the modules. You know, in theory that works, but these modules, they don't regulate voltage super accurately. So if you set the voltage, if, say, say each one of these has no load on it, and you set the voltage to be exactly the same within, you know, 20 millivolts or something, and then you put it under load. So without a load, it's all matched, but then you put it under load, you're going to get a totally different result. So I had to put a, a pretty heavy load on all of these modules at the same time, and then I had to go back and balance the current flowing through them. So I used those 0.22 ohm resistors as a current shunt. So I took my, my meter and I measured across that resistor and I matched the voltage drop across each one of those resistors to match the current that's actually flowing through. So if you turn these on without a load, each one of these modules is going to be a slightly different voltage. You know, they could be 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 volts different. But under load, they're actually current balanced very, very well probably within about 10 or 15% of each other. So that was a total nightmare, a super pain. It sucked, um, but I got through it. It worked out. Um, another hurdle I had to overcome was turning these on and off on demand. And that's these green wires here. So if you watched my previous video, I had to connect an external power supply into the control section of the board. And um, that's what these one of these is. So this is a buck boost module. So if the voltage on the input of this drops below, you know, 10, 10 volts, maybe down to nine, maybe down to eight, even, even if it's only briefly, um, this buck boost module will keep the control voltage on these at a constant, at a constant value. So by turning off the control voltage, that yellow wire there splits into all these green wires. So that's got 13.8 volts going out of it. And um, if I disconnect that from um, 13, if I did disconnect all these green wires from 13.8 volts, it shuts off the control circuitry for all of these modules and turns the power supplies off. Um, so yeah, that's kind of how I did that. And by switching that voltage on and off, it actually fires these modules up really quickly, about 40 milliseconds from the time that the switch closes to the time that these modules are all up to the correct voltage. Um, this other module, this is also another buck boost converter. Um, it's the same as that one, and I got it just for the fans. I thought maybe I was going to need a little extra current for the fans, so I got one separate for the fans. Turns out it wasn't necessary. But um, The way that the power is turned on and off going to these modules is with these MOSFETs. So these are P-channel MOSFETs, and I'm using them as a switch to turn this voltage on and off. And the reason that I went with these MOSFETs instead of a relay is because relays can have anywhere from like a 10 to a 30 millisecond delay from the time that you turn the relay on to the time that the contacts actually close. So by using these, I can completely avoid that time delay and I get, you know, nanoseconds worth of delay versus 30 milliseconds potentially. So when I, uh, when I connect these contacts over here, it closes this FET. This one's for the fan. It's basically the same setup, but it, it turns this FET on, which feeds voltage into all these modules. And they fire up and power up and everything's good to go. So the benefit of doing on-demand like that is that these modules are not going to be running when you're not actually using the radio. And that's a, that's a big issue because if you plug these things in 
This whole unit draws about an amp of current just idling with no load. So all 15 of these combined together draws about an amp of current. And if you were to leave that on in your mobile, it would sit there and drain your battery, you know, in a, in a very realistic amount of time. So I, I haven't actually done this test yet, but I'm going to do it on camera. Um, I'm going to plug this whole unit into my bench power supply. And we're going to see what the idle current draw is with, uh, with the modules turned off. So I got this foot switch over here to turn the modules on. Um, let's, let's power up the bench supply. So this bench supply, it's just a little inky laboratory supply, but it's enough to get these idling. Okay. So we're feeding 13.8 volts into here. If you see all the little red LEDs, they're all powered up. Um, they've all got power going into them, but they're not actually boosting the voltage. This is what happens when it idles with all the modules on. Yeah. It gets pretty rough. So, um, 40 milliamps, 40 to 50 milliamps. That's all it's drawing just sitting here. So if you were to put this in your mobile and plug it in, it would sit there and draw 40 to 50 milliamps. But that's such a small amount of current, um, considering the amp hour capacity of a typical mobile battery, uh, that's not going to make a dent. You know, you'd have to leave your, your truck sitting for like two months without turning it on to actually drain the battery. And uh, yeah, that's not me. I drive my mobile every day. So anywho, just thought I'd get in here and show you the details and also try and discourage you from building anything with these modules because they suck. Um, if you were using these in a base station, you know, let me take that back. There is one circumstance where I could see these modules being practical. One circumstance. That's in a base station setup where you've already got a pretty high voltage power supply and you just need to boost it up to 65 volts. So say you had an LD MOS supply, or an, I'm sorry, let's say you have an LD MOS amp and it's a 65 volt amp, but you don't have a 65 volt power supply. Maybe you have a 24 volt or a 48 volt power supply and you just need to get the voltage up. These would be great for that. And that's because the limiting factor on these is the input current, not the output current. Output current is not the limiting factor. Input current is the limiting factor on these. So if you have, if you need, let's just say 50 amps at 65 volts, if you need 50 amps at 65 volts, then you're going to need 50 amps out of each one of these. Well, if you're boosting that from 12 volts, you're going to need hundreds of amps of current to get that. But if you're boosting that from say 48 volts, you're only going to need maybe 75 amps. And in that case, you could get away with just using a few of these. You know, I'm, I'm probably only going to run pull, I'm probably not going to pull any more than, I don't know, 60 or 70 amps out of this in normal use, uh, just because I run my carrier low and I run my PEP high and all, all that stuff. But anyway, in normal use, I'm probably not going to pull much more than 60 amps. Um, but in order to do that, I have to feed about hundreds of amps into it. I, I'm not going to do the math in my head. I have to feed hundreds of amps. And that's why I have to use 15 modules. But if I were to take this and put 48 volts into it, you know, put some batteries in series, I could either remove half of these modules and still be fine, or I could get many, many times more power out of it. So anyway, I'm, I'm done rambling. I'm excited that this is all done. I can't wait to put it all together and try, but more importantly, I need to build myself a, a two pill LD MOS or hey, maybe a three. I don't think anybody's ever done a three before. Maybe I'll do that. Do, do, do you? Does anybody out there know if somebody has built a three pill LD MOS? If not, let me know. I want to be the first to do it. I mean, there's probably like three dude, three or four dudes out there that'd be like, "Oh, I could do that first, you know. And then, anyway, I want to try it. If uh, if nobody's done it before, if somebody has done it before, I'll I'll skip that and do a two pill or a four pill. But anyway, I'm Mud Duck Sharky. I hope you enjoyed learning about. Uh, how I turned this mistake into to something that works. But anyway, I'm back out for now and I'll be back with another video soon. Thanks for watching.